It's been a while since I've done a movie review, and I really couldn't think of a better time to review this movie than Halloween. Some fun trivia about this movie before we get started. It was directed by Danny Corrales, who's a professor of cinematic arts at Liberty University. And for anybody who's new here, I was a student there and was also a film student. So I know Danny and his work pretty well at this point. Uh, my mom actually bought one of his movies, Pilgrim's Progress, way back in the day. And even at a young age, me and my brother, upon watching it knew that shit was terrible. <laughs> I also saw his newest film, Heaven's War, at the Liberty University Cinematic Arts Film Festival before anybody else got to see it. Here's a clip. There's a spiritual world all around you, a battle between the light and the darkness. I'm Gabriel, the angel, and you thought I was just a myth. All this to say, my love and appreciation for Danny's filmography is deep and goes back well over a decade. And I am beyond excited to present to you what may be one of the greatest fire and brimstone, fear-based evangelism movies of the early 2000s, Escape from Hell. So our movie opens right in the action with uh, someone dying and two people trying to revive him in slow motion. Due to the fact that the highest resolution you can find this movie in is 360p, I'm gonna have to assume they filmed this digitally on a Viewmaster or something, and it just couldn't pump out a frame rate high enough to do a proper slow motion because this three and a half minute long scene is pulling maybe five frames a second. Maybe. Spoiler alert, uh, this guy here is actually a doctor, uh, given his reviving tactics. I'm not really sure he should be doing that, but he'd be an absolute killer in the ring. God damn. He's back. It's all right. Anytime you're ready, I could use a hand here. It's all right. It's okay. I got him. I've got him. Easy, easy, easy. All right, good, good. She has not said a single coherent sentence this entire sequence. He's back. Here. Uh, Danny, you know you can do more than one take, right? We have the technology. Really? Okay. Five milligrams of morphine. That ought to take you out. <laughs> you ever do this to me again, I'm gonna let you go. If you ever do this again, I will let you die. Brilliant. I can see it. You're gonna see this stupid sign a few times throughout this movie, and it won't be explained until the third time it happens. Danny breaks a lot of the rules I set up in my Christian film industry video because, frankly, he is anything if not groundbreaking. So the guy who almost died a few minutes ago and was pumped full of morphine bolts out of the hospital and steals an ambulance while a cop watches him do it, and with the calm demeanor of only someone with years of training could muster, says, Hey! Why did you call the police? I wanted to call the police. I had to call the police. You didn't have to call the police. Um, I beg to differ, man. Your buddy is currently playing IRL GTA and he's hopped up on morphine. I think on the list of reasons to call the police, this has got to be top five. <sighs> after me who's after you are you running from the police no there's this thing i brought it back it, it, it keeps chasing me keeps chasing you what keeps chasing you this thing from hell look at me look at me have you been drinking no are you doing drugs no you don't understand no i mean i have a substantial amount of drugs running through my system but that's not really any of your concern man you don't understand We've got to get you to a hospital. Just came from a hospital. 
There's nothing there they can do for me. I have to disagree. Now what's going on here? It all started about a month ago. I was reaching a breaking point and I didn't even know it. I was 29 years old, had achieved the career I'd always wanted, but it wasn't enough. I had run through all of the antidepressants. I went to therapy until I realized I knew 10 times more than my therapist. I knew I was running and running scared. I kept a smile on so nobody would know how empty I was inside. I had a cat named Bigsby. My favorite color was a nice fuchsia. I wasn't particularly fond of the Bush administration, and my mother always said I had a charming personality. Where were you bitten? Here? Okay. What happened? We were down at the, at the pond. It was a party. We were having a picnic. Paul Stover! It's our boy, Paul Goddamn Stover. If you haven't watched my Trump prophecy video, he was the fire chief in that movie. Uh, he's been in a bunch of other stuff. He was in my thesis film. He's a friend. He's a fantastic actor. And it was clearly making some money. <laughs> he more recently was a doctor on the new Hulu show, Dope Sick. Uh, so, you know, go watch that. Support my boy. All hail Paul Stober. No problem. Dad? Dad! Dad! Somebody help my dad! Somebody help my dad! Somebody help him! Hands dad! The room. So some pastor, who I guess goes around to dying people in hospitals and preaches the good word at them, shows up and this is where we're introduced to the overarching theme of the movie and the main point. God. We'll all have to give account of what we've done in our lives. And it will all come down to this one verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Except Jesus or go to hell. If this is a all loving and all merciful God, then why would he create a hell? Why would anyone reject the love and mercy of God? You see, by rejecting the, the forgiveness and love of Jesus, one chooses to die in his sins and go to hell. Okay, I'm not really here to pick apart theology, but in this specific case, I've got to say, that is the dumbest argument I think I've ever heard. Who is like walking up to someone and being like, hey man, there's an invisible guy around here and he's going to shoot you if you don't follow my religion. And then saying he chose to die because he didn't believe you. What? And then all, all the pain slipped away and I floated over my body such peace and love as I reached the top of the ceiling I saw you and everybody gathered around me before I knew it I saw myself shooting through this tunnel I saw myself going through the tunnel and I looked down and I guess it was on the roof of the hospital here. I saw the words, ducks be not proud. <laughs> Fuck you. What do we got here? Another member of the Couch Potato Club? Tad Garrison, father of two, architect. Well, his blockage looks like the freeway at rush hour. His lifestyle isn't hard to imagine. Eggs and legs all week, beers and steers on the weekend. <laughs> Damn. Can you put this dude on the back burner for a minute? He's dying. Marissa, it's Eric. I've got a patient I think fits your research criteria. So we find out Marissa is conducting an experiment asking people who have near-death experiences and trying to either prove or disprove the existence of an afterlife for the benefit of therapy and helping people who have to come to terms with the fact that they are dying. Eric. Yes. This is how we are introduced to Eric's dad, and it has what is perhaps my favorite moment in the entire movie. I've been sober for the last six months. I've been on a mission for three months now, telling everyone I can about how I owe it all to Jesus Christ. And I finally got up enough courage to come and see you. And? And I was hoping it would be a start. Look. I just left a man who really loves his family. And his heart's gonna give out in a week. And you, you come walking in here, you're a worthless piece of human garbage. Acting. 
And you told him where I was? Yes, I did. How can you even talk to him after what he did to you, after what he did to us? Well, he's different now. He's, he's become a born-again Christian. Oh, great! I know when your father is blowing smoke, okay? This was different. Do you think that this is easy for me? Do you think that I can just turn my back and forget everything that he's ever done to me? He left me to raise you by myself. He put me into personal bankruptcy. If I hadn't met your stepfather, I would still be struggling. We're going to see this happen again because characters tend to argue their own point they're making, but she is giving some dynamite reasons to never talk to that dude again. Study near-death experiences. Uh, I understand you had one yesterday. Yeah. What's the camera for? I tape my interviews. Uh, Can I ask you a few questions? I'm really not feeling well right now. Mr. Garrison? I believe that your experience can help a lot of people face the next life. I promise it won't take too much time. I'm really not feeling very well right now. Stop bothering this man. He is dying. He is in the process of leaving this mortal plane and he's getting dunked on by doctors and asked to talk about the existence of the afterlife, all while having a heart that's pumping out straight pudding. <laughs> what am I gonna do? I supposed to tell my daughter? Mrs. Garrison? This is Dr. Holloway. And she is not going to be able to help at all. Hey, cheer up. It's a beautiful day. None of my patients died. Another 3500 in the bank. And you're buying lunch. Hey, I know something that'll cheer up even your usually sour disposition. Oh, really? What? Beautiful. The talented. Dr. Marissa Holloway. Wow. You're having lunch by yourself, buddy. Marissa! Hi, Eric. Thanks for the referral. Was it good enough for lunch? Oh, I gotta get back to work. It was good enough for dinner. Hey, Carl, wait up! See you tonight. What the fuck was that scene? Th nothing happened. That entire scene breakdown is Carl has 3500 in the bank, boys lunch, no boys lunch, actually wait, yes, boys lunch, but now he's having dinner with Marissa. If you wanted to progress some kind of romantic plotline between the two, all you had to do was cut out all the middle bullshit, have her walk up to the two of them, have them ask her, do you want to go to lunch? And she goes, nah, I don't really have time for lunch. And then in the spur of the moment, Eric goes, do you want to get dinner? Boom. I, f I fixed your scene. I fixed your scene, Danny. Wait, please. Don't shut the door in my face. And you may want to stand back a couple of feet. <laughs> All right, you know what? That was kind of hard. I can't even like. I'm not going to give you a place to sleep, so is there anything else you need? Your forgiveness? It'd be a cold day in hell before that happens. Sorry. Really too late to call so. I could prove the existence of the afterlife, a place where everybody went to a place of peace and love and joy, then... You mean heaven? Right. Imagine what that would do for psychiatry. I mean, we could treat grief, we could take the fear out of dying. Well, don't you think the little fear of dying is a good thing? Think about it. If people were a little bit more afraid of dying, then maybe they would stop eating fatty foods or stop smoking or anything else that caused cancer. But have you ever seen a Christian die? Several. My grandmother. When she died, it was the most peaceful, most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. It was like she was prepared for it. All right, here we go again. Eric, you're kind of arguing against the points you just made. You just gave a great example of the benefits of believing in an afterlife. <laughs> I wanted to show you this, though. Um, how long ago did this happen? Well, it, it, it was about two years ago, but I remember it just as if it happened yesterday. What happened then? It was just the most beautiful experience. I can't even describe it. 
what is with this L.A. Noir interrogation music during these interviews? She's two questions away from blowing the case for Christ wide open. I could see. But then I stopped. Why did you stop? Oh, there, there was this incredible creature standing right in front of me. It was glorious, full of light. I knew it had to be an angel. Are you guys ready? I hope you're ready to see the most beautiful, the most magnificent, angelic creature you ever did lay eyes on? So then how do you expect to prove anything? Well, let's put it this way. Every good researcher has her little secrets. Okay, Christian movies do this a lot, and I think it's because it's one of the only ways they can get out any kind of sexual energy without sinning. But the amount of times a non-sexual scene will have a sexual undertone to it because of the way they frame their actors or have them perform the lines is wild. I mean, look at the power dynamic and the way they framed the characters, and I don't want to place any blame on the woman here, but Marissa is giving Eric the craziest fuck-me eyes I think I have ever seen. I, I fear for Eric's well-being. She's going to jump him. And for nothing, nothing happens. They don't kiss, they don't lean in and then think better of it. Nothing happens in this interaction of a sexual nature. All it does is lead into Eric doing a voiceover to explain why we keep seeing this stupid sign over and over again whenever somebody almost dies. And I hope you're ready for this. The doctor's actual plan. It is Marissa's scientific plan to try and prove the existence of an afterlife. During my near-death experience, I discovered Marissa's little secret. She had placed a sign on the hospital roof to help verify whether someone was truly having an out-of-body experience. Tad Garrison saw the message, but I didn't believe him. You heard that correctly. This bitch, a doctor of psychology, put a sign on the top of a hospital with a stupid sentence on it so that if somebody left their body and had an out-of-body experience, they could read the sign and therefore prove the existence of an afterlife. Housekeeping! He was the center of my life when I was a kid. We had some great times together. Ah yes, a classic. Great times in the default sepia tone world. <laughs> Sleep now. Sleep He's struggling. Thanks, Doc. He wants to go to the light. Tell him it's alright. Yeah. It's painless and peaceful there. Just like Go. Just let go, honey. We'll be okay. Bye, Daddy. Man, no way did they have this little girl's reaction to her father's death be... Bye, Daddy. If I die and I have an out-of-body experience and my kid goes... Bye, Daddy. I am coming back to life and killing myself all over again. Why did God juke him out like that? He could have easily said like, Hey man, I, I know it feels peaceful up here, but you're going to end up there if you don't say some words before you die for real. Man's pulled off the greatest bait and switch in history. <laughs> Justice for Paul. Eric! Eric, why didn't you fucking me? So Eric parkours through the woods and basically explains that in order to truly disprove God in the afterlife, 
He's going to kill himself. Brilliant. But then he decides not to and instead pitches the idea to Marissa. Instead of waiting around to record one of these uncontrollable experiences, why not induce a near-death experience and see what happens? You need to see a psychiatrist. Honestly, that's a pretty good response. Uh, if a friend ever walks up to you and goes, Hey man, I'm gonna kill myself to disprove the existence of God. Therapy. So what gives? What's up? Nothing. I just came by to tell you that I wouldn't be able to have dinner with you tonight. I'm killing myself later to disprove the existence of God. I just felt so ashamed. How do you tell your own mother, the woman who gave you the gift of life, that you're going to engineer your own death? Engineer your own... What a fucking nerd. Just say you're gonna kill yourself, man. <laughs> Very cold, buddy. I just got off work. Where are you? In the boiler room. Yeah, I might need your help on something. Sure, what do you need? Well, I just made myself a potassium chloride bolus cocktail. You want to join me? That'll kill you. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it will. But you're going to revive me. Hey, what are good friends for, right? Eric, that's crazy. Don't do it. There's no guarantee I can bring you back. Listen, buddy. Everything you need is here. I figure I got about six minutes until I'm a vegetable. Eric is way too calm about almost killing himself. Uh, he shouldn't be revived for the betterment of society. He's clearly dangerous and shouldn't be walking around with the rest of us. Excuse us, please, Marissa, come with me. What's come with me. What's going on? Come with me. I need your help. Why? It's Eric. What? He's dead. Do you mean he's dead? Hey man, you probably should lead with something is wrong with Eric before grabbing a woman and dragging her with you. And she was oddly calm about all of that. In an alternate reality, she pepper sprayed him and they couldn't save Eric. No, it was better than that. It was like everything I'd ever seen or felt or tasted was a mere shadow of what this was. And it wasn't just my imagination. I mean, the brain couldn't just generate this. The brain can't possibly generate mountains. <laughs> So his mom, for whatever reason, feels a disturbance in the force, and throughout the rest of his time in the afterlife, it's gonna keep cutting back to her crying and praying to God to protect her son. I don't know why, there's really no reason to do this other than to add time and false tension to your movie. What's happening to you? what he's having. <laughs> God, if you exist, get me out of here. I think he might exist, Eric. <laughs> Mr. Garrison? Boy Paul's not doing well, folks. Uh, by all appearances, he seems to be being consumed by a giant purple penis. Tad, may I ask you a question? Sure. What would you say if God were to ask you, Tad, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? I'd say I've been a good person most of my life. I go to church on Sunday. I love my wife and kids. I try to help people who are in need. I try not to hurt anybody intentionally. That's what I tell him. Fine, but that won't get you or anyone else into heaven. The fact of the matter is that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The fact of the matter is the muscles in my face don't work anymore. Also, you're going to hell. Okay, Mr. Outlaw, the scene taught this. Legalism is keeping man-made religious rules, thinking that you are obtaining righteousness with God. It's the thought, I am good because I am doing good things. That's wrong. God hates legalism. Why? Because Paul said, if you can be saved by the keeping of the law, 
punishment there at the end of that one. Ah, Paul, why'd you change the channel to football, man? Why'd you turn off the pastor speaking? That's a rookie mistake. Shock him again. Did they really not give this bitch any dialogue to work with? Did they just get on set and they're like, I don't know, wing it and cry? Because she has not said a coherent sentence since Eric decided to go down and slap Satan's ass cheeks. We have heard her just go, Ugh! for like six minutes now. Let's go. Ah! Oh, it was real. Yeah, that... Telling you, I wasn't alive two seconds before I knew this thing was still after me. It's here. He can't harm me. I'm covered in the blood of the Lamb. My name is in the Book of Life. And I'm telling you, demon from hell, in the name of Jesus Christ. Suck my dick. Is it gone for good? It can unless... Unless what? Unless you give your life to Jesus. That's the only thing that's gonna save you and protect you. Well, that seems to be a rather convenient plot point. Please save my soul. Please save me. Please save my soul. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. I need to talk. Didn't like the way he said that. <laughs> said that shit like it was her turn to go to the boiler room. And that was Escape from Hell. I had to leave out a ton of footage just for time's sake. There's so many other good bits and scenes and uh, tremendous pieces of dialogue that you should definitely watch while drinking with friends. You can view the full thing on YouTube. Uh, it's got Indian subtitles. It is an absolute trip. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this, you can choose between my Trump prophecy review or my review of Kirk Cameron's Saving Christmas, a movie so bad he took to Facebook to get his fans to rate it better to own the libs.